Hello friends, hope you are well. Welcome to part one, or rather the introduction to the build series I'll be doing on this uh, computer build that, uh, well, it'll include the latest AMD CPU. It'll include the 3090 that you might've saw me unboxing. I wanna talk about the parts we're gonna be using in this build. I usually do a build every three, four years, like a new one. And this year I went for a bit of a mixture of not purely gaming, but a little bit of workhorse stuff, which I usually only went for gaming, so this might be interesting. So let's talk about the parts, and then hopefully later in this video series, you'll see putting things together, see the, I guess, the outcome, and see what I got to play with. The prologue, where we find out what parts Pat bought, the stupid amount of time it took for the parts to arrive, other complaints, and between you and me that his wife still doesn't know exactly how much it all cost. So first of all, what are we using for the graphics card? I think that's probably the most exciting. The 3000 series RTX card, uh, it was the first one to release versus the Radeon cards, so my choice was pretty clear. I was unfortunately gonna have to go with this because I've been using this card already in the computer for a little while because, well, a lot of parts just weren't arriving on time. So the problem here is it's a mishmash of items that arrived weeks and weeks after each other and I believe I'm not the only one. The Zotac card is a reference card to the uh, 3090 and it performs really, really well. Uh, there's actually nothing wrong with the cooling except I think it runs a little bit hot. Um, that might just be the 3090 and that's why we're gonna be watering, water cooling it with this EK Quantum Vector one. So EK makes obviously specific GPU water blocks for each card type and that's kind of hard on the manufacturer because you've got a lot of SKUs and you don't make many. So getting one of these, it took about a month to arrive. This is 260 Australian dollars. This was $2,750 and this is gonna be interesting. There's no backplate, which you have to buy another backplate for $70, something to keep in mind. So that goes with the card. For RAM, we're using the Vengeance LPX. Um, it is 2,666 megahertz, but it is C16, which is exactly what I need. Now, the reason I went with this one is because I already had two other sticks. So this is a set of two times 16 gigs, so 32 here. I've already got 32 in the same brand. So I thought, well, we can get another 32. This is really cheap because it's an older brand of memory um, and that's already in the computer right now. Now for fans, uh, some of you may have commented about my fans in the past. They looked precarious and so I've had to change them out and I decided to go with these Corsair ones. Now there's a bit of thought process that went into this. First of all, price. They were $39 each from the UK because everywhere else they're about $40 to $50. So I had to wait again a long time for them to arrive. So we got four of them. Um, they only came in three packs or one pack. So I had to get a three and a one. It was a bit weird. In any case, I got a good deal on them from Amazon. They are RGB, they are PWM, and what this means is two things. First of all, you need a separate RGB controller for them, and you also need a PWM controller. And obviously, if you've got four fans, you need four headers, or you get a controller, which is what we got right here. So we got four of those fans. They're already in the cooler or the radiator. Um, we got one of these Corsair Commander Pros. Uh, this was $90, I believe, and it's absolutely stupid. I'm embarrassed for Corsair. I'm embarrassed what I have to describe here. This is a controller for your fans. Great, good stuff, but it doesn't control the RGB. To control the RGB, you have to get another $30 pack to control the RGB. This, Corsair, this is what you've done. Why don't you just charge $120 for both things? If somebody's buying a PWM controller for a fan, they're gonna get one that would also control the bloody RGB. You sell the fans yourself. Corsair, what the hell? In any case, this was basically impossible to get locally. It was sourced internationally and it came in a stupid little box. And this thing obviously came normally, but look, the packing thing, I, I don't know. It just, I'm just pissed off that I had to do that. So that's that. Obviously the CPU Ryzen 5000 series, Ryzen 9. Um, this is the 5950X and it's been performing magnificently, even though the air cooler that I have on it right now is not really cooling it enough. It's got pretty high um, degrees at the moment, about 70 when I'm rendering video. But to be honest, 74, 75 when you're rendering a video, that's pretty good. Pretty dumb impressive from the Ryzen point of view. Now, this is not the best gaming CPU. The 5800X would be the better one. It actually performs a little bit better, but it, this is much more of a workhorse, especially when I'm rendering a lot of videos. So this CPU is going in there. It's already running. So, I mean, uh, you know, I've got a couple of tests 
here. This is the water cooling step that we're going to be doing. And to water cool this one right here is actually something quite unique also from EK. They seem to be really on the ball when creating these things. This is an EK CPU water block that is specific to this motherboard, the ROG 5070, X5070 eGaming. Um, the main difference for this one is that I bought it early because I knew there was going to be a rush when the AMD CPUs came out, but I knew that it would support it with a BIOS update. The beauty of this actual motherboard is that it has an automatic USB updating way or basically a process where you don't have to have a CPU inside. You plug in the USB, you press a button on the side of the motherboard and as long as you have the 24 pin plugged in, it will actually update the BIOS itself. So you have to update a BIOS to run the 5000 series if it isn't one of the more refreshed lines of motherboards. So then what makes this special? Well, it is got obviously RGB in it, of course, but this fits exactly well into covering a lot of the parts of the CPU area here with Northbridge or I guess Southbridge, whatever it is, not Intel, but whatever the parts around it are, this will actually cover it all. And that means it'll cool the whole area of the CPU, which should give not only better performance, but longevity to your parts. So that it is, it's really, this was about $480 Australian. This was 1250, the fans 39 each. This Quantum EK block was 260, I believe. And this Commander was $90 and these were $150. And this was $30, actually 45 with delivery because had to go international. So this is what we're working with, with the parts. And obviously we're actually using the same case as I've been using in the past. I absolutely love that case. So stay tuned for some videos of putting it together. Chapter one, where we see the motherboard and CPU on camera with some background talk that sounds smart. First steps are pretty easy. Let's get the motherboard out of the packet. And you know what I usually do? I like to put the motherboard on the box and install the CPU that way. Now, I'm sure you've seen a lot of videos on how to install a CPU. So this time around, it is the same deal. We got to find the little notch on the left-hand side corner, but make sure to lift the little uh, valve there, wrench beforehand, find the corner and poke it in gently, of course. AMD CPUs have the spiky bits on the CPU, unlike the Intel ones, which have them built into the motherboard. Chapter two, where two hands install the CPU water block onto the motherboard without breaking anything and not using a static wrist guard. We can then start unpacking the EK water block for the actual motherboard. And of course you have to pick the right product for your right motherboord. It comes with a whole bunch of screws and it is of course RGB, which means you need to connect a little cable and and you can sort of hide it within the motherboard itself. You will need to unscrew the actual heat sinks from the motherboard and the screws are on the back and there's quite a few you need to take care of. Now be very careful when you lift it, there is a plastic cover there for the shroud of the ports and you also have to take that off a little bit to get it out of the way so you can lift the rest of it out. The pack also comes with a little blue shield there. Basically putting that underneath means that you don't damage any of your components at the bottom with the scratchiness of metal. Of course, it comes with thermal pads that you need to make sure to take off both sides of the plastic. One side is a very dark plastic. It's a little bit thicker also and more stiff. The other side is a light plastic. So make sure to take them both off before you stick them on. Now EK has given you enough thermal pads to make some mistakes, but be very careful when you do because they are also different millimeter thicknesses and you can't just go and buy another one. You will need to figure out what thickness these ones are. Now you will have enough to do all the bits and pieces here. So the large bits and the small bits and make sure to again, take off the plastic coverings. Put a bit of thermal paste on your CPU and plop the water block straight on and gently press in. You'll be able to put the shroud back on the port side and you will be able to turn it over to the other side. Make sure to put the little blue cover on first to protect the components from the metal and then you can actually basically start screwing things in. Make sure to put the little grommets in between the screws to protect the motherboard again and gently screw them in one by one. Do not put too much pressure at first. Make sure everything settles down, especially the thermal paste on the CPU when you use the Allen key to gently put each side opposite first and you can go around and gently put them all back in, giving a half turn each time or a full turn when you have enough momentum. 
give it a tight on around the other little screws, but again, be very gentle. You should be able to then navigate to the cable under the shroud and have it come out to the top where the motherboard can be plugged in. And you can now put your actual fittings back in. Make sure to use a screwdriver or Allen key that can fit inside and tighten them up. Not too tight to crack the actual plastic. Chapter 3, where Pat's giant head gets in the way of the RTX 3090 as he installs the EK water block without a backplate because EK is too cheap to include one. All right, I'm a little bit annoyed the fact that EK did not provide an actual backplate with this pack. I think it's actually a little bit ridiculous that you have to pay $280 for this and then they hold back another backplate, then you have to pay another $70. If you would like a more detailed video of installing this, there is one on my channel and you can see how I undo the Zotac cover and get to the actual motherboard so we can put the water block on. If we start removing some of the screws behind the fans, we can get to the back and remove those screws and basically it just all starts falling apart very slowly. Be very gentle when removing the actual metal cooling part that is literally just stuck to that chip and there's a little cable that does all the RGB and the actual fan power. As you can see, there is still another part to take off. And no, unfortunately, this backplate cannot be used with the EK water block. Make sure to clean off any of the thermal paste that you have here, especially if you're putting it in storage. And as you might even notice, on top of the actual chips on this graphics card, there are a little bit of thermal pads that are peeling off and just didn't come off very well. You need to clean them off before you put on the new thermal pads. They are unfortunately not a good quality as you'd expect. And so the one you're actually putting on is much better quality. So overall, it's actually a good thing that you're putting this on. Now there are little bits and pieces of chips that you need to cover. The instructions aren't really provided in the box. You actually have to look them up online. But if you pause this video at a certain point, you will see where the blue is covered and make sure to take off the covers of the thermal paste, the plastic layers, there's two, a dark blue one and a light blue one on top, make sure to take them off. You can use a sharp little tool to take them on after you stick them on to not get any grease on them, especially from your hands, but you'll be able to cover them all. You should have a good view of what needs to be filled out now. Then we can take our thermal paste, put some on. You can be very generous with this one, especially with graphics cards, and we can plop it upside down onto the actual water block. We do this because we need a screw from the other side. Now, the screws do fit in certain sizes, so make sure you pick the right sizes based on the instructions, and also be very gentle as you screw it in, because you don't wanna bend the card, it needs to be very flush, and what might actually happen is there might be a little bit of thermal pad left over, the black pad, and it's causing the card to bend. End. So make sure to clean it all off. Once you've done that, you can gently screw in all the screws and you're done. Chapter four, where the giant head returns to show Pat's internal cable management and we proceed to cry and comment below about it. All right, all right, settle down. Yes, there's gonna be a bunch of issues with this. But to be honest, I really like this case. I have mounted a TV mount onto it, onto the back plate, so I can actually hang it up on a wall, which I absolutely love. Having it off the floor means less dust and so the cable management has to just deal with it there is some issues here but let's just walk it through it there's a lot of hard drives and there's not much hard drive mounting space there are two 3.5 millimeter hard drive slots but apart from that everything else has to sort of hang this case has gone through many generations of parts and so it's well worn the only problem I have with the cables is that they've just been there for a long time. My PSU has gone through three generations of computers and I'm very proud of that, but it also means that the cables never really change. They're always in the same spot and I just add and remove bits and pieces. I could do some cleanup, but at the moment I kind of don't have the time. So it's gonna be like this for now. The reservoir and pump is being installed right now into the side and then off we go. We can start working on the front because yeah, there's nothing else to do in the back. Chapter 5, where Big Head's younger brother's big hands return to install the RTX 3090 and the ASUS motherboard. 
Now the best way to install a motherboard is if you put it flat down onto a table and you can just drop it in. This is a very heavy motherboard, so the best thing to do is put it on the ground. Don't plug the 24 pin in just yet. We need to get a few bits and pieces in. Since I'm putting into a case that already has a bunch of cables, I know exactly where they are and I can route them in, plug them in. And remember, there are also M.2 slots in this motherboard and before you add anything else, make sure to put those M.2 drives inside. They're on the left there and on the right in the middle and you'll be able to install everything else without having to rip everything apart to put something else in. The riser cable is there to make the GPU actually vertically mounted instead of into the side. Because of the weight it actually works out a lot better and it's much better for water cooling because all the actual ports will be facing out and I can just run a few pipes through the front and back with my 90 degree angles. I do like that style and I'm gonna do it the same way in this build. Chapter six, where we discover that Pat's memory card filled up and he did not record the laying of pipes. I was so enthralled in building this PC while also watching TV that I didn't even notice the camera ran out of memory. And so here we are. You can only see me putting in or actually measuring one pipe. It's a pretty easy job because they're all straight runs with an angular one. So you just measure it up, make sure the runs can actually fit when the glass gets put back on. So they need to be fairly short in regards to extending out from the motherboard and GPU. Make sure to have the flow direction going from the pump and reservoir into the two components that are gonna be heated and out to the cooling. That should be enough heat dissipation if you have a four slot radiator. Chapter seven, where after five hours of labor, we start to fill the loop with our sweat and tears, aka demonalized water, and we learn one fan has a faulty RGB. So here comes the most stressful part. I tend to use a little syringe and I fill it with water and I slowly put it in the top instead of trying to spill things over. And if you have a big enough one, it should mean that you should only do a few of these before it fills it up. Now there is a pin you can put into your 24 pin slot. As you can see here on the top, that means you can turn on the power and it'll run, but it will not power the components because if water gets onto the components and they are powered, they will get damaged. So for the next few minutes, what we're gonna be doing is filling it up up and then actually running the power and running it through the whole entire loop. Now the radiator does fill up pretty quickly because it's not a lot of space inside. So once you get it going, you can just fill it up. The bubbles do go away after 48 hours, as you can see on the CPU block, that will actually disappear and has disappeared already for me. And over time, all the bubbles will leave. So make sure to check any leaks, put a couple of rags just to catch it. Like it's not too hard, maybe some paper towels or anything like that and you should be pretty golden if everything's nicely put in and tight. Chapter eight, where the audience finally get to see the finished product and realize they could have just skipped to the end and be disappointed by the cables again. Yeah, the cables can look a little bit bad. You can hide them, but with an open air case like this, it's a little bit more difficult. If you've got a basement in the bottom of your case, sure, you can hide the PSU cables or even route the cables to the back. I have yet to do that because the cables are a little bit short and I've mounted it on a wall quite a long way away from my computer. The computer looks absolutely brilliant at night. The RGB is fantastic. That RGB one that's broken there at the top, it's still broken. Amazon did give me a $20 refund, so I wouldn't have to send it back. And I've put in the new G-Skill memory to match up with the AMD CPU because performance is much better with the new AMD CPUs when the actual RAM frequency is a lot higher. The computer's been running at full bore for over three, four weeks now and it's been absolutely fantastic it is super quiet the four fans from Corsair are brilliant now before water cooling the CPU and GPU's temperature were about 50 55 to 60 at idle for the CPU and 40 to 50 on the GPU idle now the GPU is around 35 to 38 idle and the actual CPU is around 40 to 45 at idle you could lower the individual components temperatures if you added an extra radius in between the actual GPU and CPU, but because we're cooling both things at once, overall the temperatures when it goes into full bore is around 60 to 65. It's about a 20 degree increase with max utilization for both the GPU and CPU as tested with Fermark and IDA64. Overall, the system is extremely quiet compared to an air-cooled system, and for me, that makes a big difference. You're gonna sit here and record audio without having to turn the whole computer off. Chapter nine, where the audience likes the video and subscribes. Thanks for watching.